throughout modernity, there's been this interesting phenomenon of public trials. And sometimes it's, it's pretty random. You might just have a legal case, somebody suing somebody, or a case against somebody who allegedly murdered someone. And for whatever reason, maybe because the victim or the alleged murderer is a celebrity or is popular for whatever reason, it becomes this public trial. It's all over the newspapers. It's the talk of the town. Everybody wants to listen in on the case. Oh, did you hear what happened when the prosecutor asked him these questions? And it becomes a, a fiasco. People line up outside of the courtrooms to take pictures and to see what's going on. It's really a, a reasonable judge's worst nightmare when all of a sudden everything is out in public and you're allowing the media and the people who have only part of the story to weigh in so heavily, possibly on the minds of the judges. Impartial. In more recent days, we have these cases that are live-streamed. Can you believe that? The entire case is live-streamed. You could sit at home, go on Facebook, and you can watch the entire trial, and you look at the comment section, and everybody's making their verdicts. Everybody's making their judgments. They already say, oh, he's guilty. Oh, he's innocent. This trial should have stopped a long time. All of these opinions all over the place. But as you know... In the court of law, at the end of the day, it's the court's verdict that matters, not popular opinion. But I will tell you what, there certainly are some cases where the evidence is so clear, the perpetrator is so caught red-handed, that as the case goes on, even the jury already knows their verdict and at that point, they're just going through the motions. It is, as many would say, as, as um, popularly is said, an open and shut case. Well, the same is true about God's final judgment on sinners. When it comes to the courtroom of God, there is due process. Indeed, there comes a time where the books will be opened... And each one will be judged according to the It's like a trial is still going and the jury hasn't officially brought the verdict yet and it's not yet read out, read out by the judge. That day of judgment hasn't happened yet. The day of judgment upon sinners is yet to come. Yet God has already begun to judge the world. In fact, unbeknownst to many people, he has already made a verdict. And in this passage, John chapter 3, we looked at verse 16 last week, and now we look at the rest of it, 17 to 21, we learn that those who remain in unbelief are already judged, condemned while those who are believing in the Son of God are declared righteous and accepted by God. I want us this morning to consider the present reality of God's judgment. Often when we talk about the judgment of God or when we talk to people about the judgment of God, we talk about it in this way. Don't you know that one day you're going to die and you're going to face God and he's going to judge you? That is true. The Bible does talk about that. We need to understand that. But we also need to understand the present reality of God's judgment, which is upon mankind this very moment. Now, this is all, all of this from verses 17 to 21 comes right after the greatest verse in this book, many would argue, John 3, 16. And that is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So we, we considered the greatest expression of God's love which is that He gave His only begotten Son. 
And then we consider the greatest experience of, God love, of God's love. And that is that all who believe in His Son have eternal life. And what did we see in John 17? What is eternal life? This is the greatest expression of God's love. It is to know God and the one whom He has sent. It is to be one. To be in communion with our triune God. Our God who is Himself love. So this is the greatest experience of God's love. It is to be one with Him. It is to be brought into His communion of love. Then comes these verses about God's judgment. So a couple of things I want us to think about. The first thing is this. Christ is accepting condemnation. Think about that. Rejecting Christ, who is the one and only Savior of sinners is essentially accepting condemnation. Verse 17. Now, this is an important thing for us to know. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world. So, so start with that. The primary mission of Christ was not to go into the world and condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. That was His primary mission. This is not to say that Christ will not condemn sinners. In fact, the verses will go on to say that people are condemned already. But Jesus primarily was sent by the Father not to condemn humanity, but to save humanity. You know why his primary mission in being born of the virgin, born under the law, living a righteous life, dying? Not to condemn humanity, but to save it. You know why? Every person and work of Jesus Christ, who He is and what He's done. But for those who don't believe, what does it mean to be condemned already? And what is the evidence of this present condemnation, the present reality of God's judgment? I want us to consider a few passages. First of all, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Please turn there with me. Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 3, we read, And you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So look at the language there. Those outside of Christ are called sons of disobedience and are considered children of wrath. So what does it mean to be condemned already? It means being under the wrath of God. What is the evidence of being under the wrath of God? It's our own experience as sinners being sons and daughters of disobedience. All we need to do is look at our lives. The sinner just needs to look at his or herself, and you will see the disobedience. You will see the rebellion. You will see that we are at enmity with God. Do you know what it means here to be children of wrath? Well, it's sort of like if you're a child of God, you have an intimate relationship with God. If you're a child of wrath, which sinners are, you have an intimate relation with the wrath of God. That's quite clear. It's a scary thought. Or how about, go all the way to, exit, uh, to Genesis chapter 2 with me. I'm sure you'll be familiar with this curse, the primary curse that is given in light of sin or um, because of sin. Genesis 2 verse 16 and the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So what does it mean to be condemned already? It means that you remain under this curse, the curse of death. What is the evidence that you are under the curse of death? You are dying. You look at the world around us. 
you see the death and decay. You begin to understand those passages like in Romans chapter 1 that say that we are without excuse. The evidence is clear. Romans 1 in particular is talking about how the divine attributes of God is made known to us through creation, through nature. We cannot deny that there is a God. And also, we can say that we cannot deny that we are under the curse of death. We cannot deny that we are in, in, at enmity with this God. We cannot deny that we are dying. We are decaying. This experience in this life is confirmation that we are under that curse of death. And how about one more place? 1 John 5.19 we read this. We know that we are from God, speaking of Christians, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. So, what does that look like? The world walks in the path of evil. The sinner continues to love sin just like the devil does. We are following the footsteps of the evil father, Satan. So this ought to challenge us. We ought to know our state before God. What is our status? Are we already condemned or are we saved? You see, when I was a fake Christian growing up in a um, strong prosperity gospel, name it and claim it kind of movement, I knew deep down I wasn't obeying God, walking with God. I wasn't living as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'll tell you what, my life, according to my worldly opinions, was going just fine. And I thought to myself, look, I've got this church stuff, believe in the gospel and you're saved and that's it. And I've got my own life of drugs, immorality, and all of this craziness. God hasn't struck me down yet. I haven't even gotten sick, or at least not too sick. I'm happy. I'm happy living my double life. God's obviously okay with it. Little did I know, that in itself was the judgment of God. That in itself. The, the sinner growing callous to good and evil, being okay with living a double life, starting to love your sin, starting to call good evil and evil good, starting to think that it's okay to be a hypocrite. That in itself is a judgment from God. He was giving me what I wanted. My hypocrisy, my double living, my sin. And I was going deeper and deeper into sin. Little did I know, as an unbeliever, I was under the condemnation of God. And it wasn't just this future thing, but it was what I was in right then and there. And if you were a sinner, are a sinner, which you are, you've had that same experience. Maybe you didn't think about it in that way. But before you became a Christian, you enjoying your life of sin was already a sign of your condemned state. But God does turn sinners into saints. God does save those who were previously in the state of death, in the state of decay and condemnation, not just physical death, but even spiritual death. But we should think about this more. How do we know someone is condemned? Well, my life was an illustration. Your lives were illustrations. This brings us to our second point. Rejecting Christ is loving darkness. Rejecting Christ is loving darkness. It's not an honest mistake. It's not when we turn our backs on God and we're, because we're... It's not that we're just misinformed. We are being lovers of evil. 
Make no mistake, that's what the sinner is doing. Verse 19 reads, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Brothers and sisters, here's the verdict. This is the judgment of God. People would rather remain in darkness than come to the light. Why? Because our works are evil. We want to continue in sin. You know how we often ask people, uh, do you want to go to heaven when you die? And almost any person would say, well, yes, it sounds like a good place. I would love to go to heaven when, you di when I die. But let me ask you something. What happens in heaven? Well, for the sinner who loves their sin, there is something that goes on in heaven which they do not want. And that is righteousness and the eradication of all sin. There will be no sin in heaven. There will be only righteousness in heaven. So, those pictures, uh, those ideas that people have um, when their uncle passes away and go, well, I sure do hope that there's golf in heaven. I sure do hope that this, uh, these sentimental thoughts were, were, were missing what is really there. What is there is a holy God and a people who have been glorified when all sinners and all evil is cast out into the outer darkness. So, if we love our sin, if we keep on sinning, if we desire to keep on sinning, think about this. Heaven would be like hell to us. It all of a sudden would actually seem like a horrible place for the sinner who wants sin. A place where the one thing they want to keep on doing can no longer be done. It's where God is all in all. Sin is no more. Righteousness dwells and sinners are made eternally one with God. Someone who wants to continue sinning does not want that. And so, condemnation is God saying, if you love eternity in hell where grace is no more and your sin will run rampant without hindrance. That is what God is saying. Real quickly, Ian, Ian all you need to do, I see the messages popping up. Um, the live stream is on right now. There is, Ilya, Ilya can help you. There is a funny symbol there that will allow you to take that link and send it to whoever you want. Yeah. You know the get link symbol, Ilya? Sorry for the interruption, but that's the interesting thing about having people away who um, are messaging and saying, we can't hear what's going on. <laughs> you know that three dot thing? The light has come into the world. God is light, 1 John 1, 5. You go to the Old Testament, what is light? It's God's wisdom, it's God's revelation. Light is good. It, it gives us life. It opens our eyes. And Jesus is that light who has come into the world. But what does our passage say? Instead of coming to the light, people loved the darkness. You know, it's very hard to admit that we love darkness. Even amongst the unbelieving world, there is this general idea that we should pursue good, and we should condemn evil. And especially in these days, everybody wants to be seen as ethical. Even in, in the strangest ways. Are you using a plastic straw? Oh, it's going to kill all of these things. You need to use a paper straw. How dare you? People want to seem better. They want to seem good. They want to seem ethical. Yet here is what we see. No matter how ethical you seem, Unbelievers are people who love darkness. And when you become a Christian, you are forced to this conclusion. 
Because it is, when you become a Christian, it is when the light, who is Jesus Christ, shines into your dark life and takes you out of the kingdom of darkness and brings you into the kingdom of light. You can't become darkness. You have been in darkness. Jesus came to save sick people, not people who are well. I was forced to this conclusion, like I mentioned earlier, that my, my drugs were like basically my God. I worshipped it. First thing in the morning, that's what I want. Before I sleep, that's what I want. All throughout the day, I need it throughout the day just so I could function as a person. I felt most myself when I was indulging in that sin. Have you ever experienced that? A sin that became so a part of you, that was so normal to you, that you felt most you, most normal when you were doing it. Maybe indulging in pornography. Maybe when you are mistreating your family members and you are angry, getting what you want, like we talked about last Sunday night, through your sinful anger, you feel powerful, you feel strong. What have you turned into your God? Like Your anger, your lying, your lust, your pride, and it's hard for sinners to admit these things because look at verse 20. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. See, that's why it's scary to come to the light. That's why sometimes you become a Christian and some of your friends want to avoid you. It's a scary thing to be exposed. It's a scary thing. To, I mean, is it really so bad to accept an invitation to come to, to church and hear the Word of God? At face value, it doesn't seem scary at all. Nobody's going to bother you. Nobody's going to hurt you. I mean, we're pretty peaceful people. But deep down inside, that conscience is still there. And we know as sinners that when we come to the five, the light shines in the darkness, speaking of Christ, and the darkness has not overcome it. Darkness might see, he will draw you to himself. The darkness will not overcome the light of Christ. So let us end considering this question. How do you know you're in the light? How does someone actually know that they are in the light? Well, John wrote a few other things, including one John that seeks to answer this question, is very instructive when considering this question. So please turn to 1 John chapter 1. So firstly, we see this in verse 5 to 7. This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have, the, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So how do you know you're in the light? You walk in the light. Walking speaks of your lifestyle. It speaks of the way you live, the trajectory of your life. You can tell, even just using a physical um, um, illustration, you can tell a lot about a person by the way that they walk. You can maybe tell that they have a broken back. You can maybe tell that they are an athlete. You can tell a lot of things about a person just by their gait and how they walk. In the same way, you can tell if a person is in the light in the way that they live their lives. And then it says in verses 8 onwards, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now this is interesting. The verses before clearly said that you will walk 
in a new way. You will walk in obedience to God. But that does not mean you're going to walk around pretending to be perfect. You're going to walk around pretending to be sinless. These verses then tell us that you can't be a Christian if you think that you are sinless. In fact, a Christian is one who daily confesses, I'm a sinner in need of grace. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. One more. Verses 9 to 11. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. This is now speaking of love for the family of God. You can't say you belong to Christ. You love Christ without loving the bride of Christ, His church. We were saved not just as individuals, but as a corporate body of His people. So those in the light are those who walk in a new way, pursuing righteousness in Christ Jesus, confessing daily, I'm a sinner in need of grace, and are increasing in love for God and love for the church. That's why you cannot find anywhere in the New Testament a churchless Christian. A true Christian is one who joins his or herself to the family of God and corporately gathers with his or her brothers and sisters. Now, so much more could be said about what it looks like to be in the light, but I don't want us to fall into looking solely at ourselves as the basis of our assurance of salvation. There's a danger in that as well. There is a danger in fruit checking to the point where you to be depressed because every day you look at yourself and you see that you fall short and you think to yourself, I don't have enough fruit, then maybe I'm not a Christian. And you go into this, uh, am I a Christian? Am I not a Christian kind of thing? No, the traits that we just spoke of are not the root of our salvation. Just remember that they are merely the fruit of our salvation. If you want true assurance, well, the root of our salvation is found in what John had already said in previous verses. In fact, in the beginning of 1 John, here's what he says in 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it. He's speaking of Jesus, of course and testify to it, and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you. Church, this is the root of your salvation. So that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Christ! His person and perfect work is the root of our salvation. By believing in Him, you know you are no longer in darkness, but are in the light. Sinners need to face the present reality of God's judgment, but for those who believe in Christ, you should also face the present reality of God's salvation. Eternal life which does not begin when you die, but the moment you believe. Just as condemnation is a prevailing reality for those in unbelief, eternal life, communion with God, enjoying the love of the Father through the Son, communicated to us by the Spirit, being at peace with God, knowing Him, being intimate with Him is a present reality for the believer today. 
What a great God we have. A God who sent His Son first and foremost not to condemn, but to save. And we believers are the salvation. Let us pray. Our loving God. A God who so loved the world that He gave His Son. We thank You, Lord, that even our own unbelief, for those of us who are now believers, even our own unbelief was no match to the power of Your light in bringing us to our knees out of darkness and into Your kingdom. Thank You, Father, that You have showered us with such great love and we thank you that we can enjoy that right now. And it's not just a concept, an idea, or a future thing, but right now. So we pray, dear God, that you would help your people this day to know what it really means to walk in newness of life, to walk in the good works that you have prepared beforehand for your people, and to enjoy communion with you every moment of our life, for it is indeed available through faith in your Son. Strengthen us through what has been proclaimed from your word. And, O oh God, we pray that we would continue to warn those around us of the present reality of your judgment. May you help us and equip us to preach the gospel to those who are already in a state of condemnation. But may what we learned this morning also grow our compassion for unbelievers, knowing, Lord, that we are no better whatsoever, and that even as those who have been redeemed by grace, we still struggle with sin. So may that therefore humble us, especially in our evangelistic encounters, as we seek to bring the gospel to the lost. May we preach with hearts filled with tenderness and compassion and a genuine heartbrokenness for those who don't know you.